You know, sometimes I get up here and I tell you, it's going to be a rough one, so just hold on. We'll get through it together. Well, it's not going to be like that today. And as a matter of fact, the way I see it, the Holy Spirit's been very gentle with us lately. We've been through a lot, and He knows it. We're all battle fatigued. But I thank God for His loving kindness. And while God won't allow me to sugarcoat things for us, He's loving and kind. And He knows just what we need and when we need it. So today we're going to talk about mercy. So thank you, Spencer. Great song. <laughs> Great is His mercy and grace. What is mercy? Webster's Dictionary defines it as kindness in excess of what might be expected or demanded of fairness. Doesn't that sound good? Don't we all need some excess kindness in our lives, especially in this harsh world that we live in? He wants that. God also asks us to show mercy to others. He wants us to be good to people, even the ones that don't deserve it, even the ones who haven't been good to us. And what's the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is what gets us out of trouble. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. I like to use the anagram, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. That helps us to remember what grace really is. By grace, Jesus saved us, and mercy flowed from Jesus' last words in Luke 23, 24. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Love is the common denominator between mercy and grace. Mercy and grace, love and forgiveness, are characteristics of the one true God functioning in tandem as he sits sovereign on the throne of heaven. God knits these traces together, or these traits together, in a beautiful tapestry of redemption and restoration for all of us. Life doesn't always feel like a tapestry, though, does it? Let's face it, as long as we live in this sinful world, we're going to be hurt by people. <coughs> and, and they'll disappoint us as well. We've been through that collectively as a church body recently. Well, for a long time for some of you, many things, many things have affected you. Human nature leads us to dislike people that hurt us. I just dealt with that this week. I had to watch someone up in front of the church, no less, get up and speak. Someone whose words don't match up with their walk. Someone who has hurt me and has hurt people that I love. I sat there all smug for a minute, and then God said, what are you doing? And that's all I needed to say. He didn't have to say another word. I knew what he was saying to me. I had to adjust my attitude and forgive her and try to filter what she was saying and how I was feeling through the word. See, God's desire for us is to love all people, including people that have hurt us and caused us harm. If we show people love instead of judgment and anger, they'll see kindness in excess of what might be expected, which is what we said the definition of mercy was. More importantly, they will see Christ at work in us. No matter how wicked or vile or unlovable we deem someone to be, God loves them just as much as he loves you and me. We were wicked and vile and unlovable at one time ourselves. As a matter of fact, sometimes we still are. <laughs> and though they need to see Jesus at work in our lives so they'll desire to know him because they see a difference in our lives and a difference in how we love. I believe one of the greatest things we can do in life is to follow the example of Jesus. We can do that by being generous in spirit and showing others the mercy that they need. Let's look at a passage of scripture that gives us a perfect example of Jesus' mercy. John 8, 1 through 11. Ready for me? Jesus walked up the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again and soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. So he sat down and taught them. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. So they brought this woman in through the crowd in front of Jesus and 
because she had committed adultery. And the people that brought her to him, they weren't just scribes. They weren't just professional copiers of the Old Testament. These people were experts in the Word, in the Torah. And they knew full well what the Word said about adultery. Then Jesus said, Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us what to do. Or tell us, what do you say we should do with her? They were only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the laws of Moses. And make no mistake about it. They knew that according to Leviticus 20.10, the adulterer and the adulteress were to surely to be put to death. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting that he answer their question. So Jesus stood up and looked at them and said, Let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over again and wrote some more words in the dust. Now, we don't know what Jesus was writing because the scriptures don't tell us that. But do you suppose he could have been writing something like, their sinful desires and their thoughts, and maybe even writing their names. <laughs> I don't know, but you can believe that he was writing something that was making them very uncomfortable because they all scattered. Jer- but he was writing more than just that. Just whatever he was writing was fulfilling the prophecy in Jeremiah 17:3 that says that all those who forsake God, which is spiritual, adultery, their names will be written in the dust. So if we turn away from God and turn to something else that meets our needs, that's spiritual adultery. We've all committed that. We've all done that. Well, let's look at our text again, verses 9 through 11. Upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, with a convicted conscience. That says something right there, too. If we're doing things right, we should be getting wiser as we get older. The old dudes were saying to themselves, Oh, I see where he's going with this. I'm out of here. (laughs) The young dudes were more arrogant in their youthfulness, and it took them longer to figure out that he was turning the tables on them. Verse 10 says, Until finally, Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up and said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. The Torah requires two witnesses to condemn someone to stoning, and there was no one left. They were all gone. Jesus said, Then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go, and from now on, be free from a life of sin. And the Aramaic translation says, Neither do I put you down or oppress you. How's that for mercy? He didn't have to do that. By the law, she could have been stoned. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 tells us that God's compassions fail not and his mercies are new every morning. In Isaiah 43, 25, he says, I am he who blots out your transgressions and remembers your sins no more. When someone hurts us, our first reaction may be to think, you're not going to treat me that way. And if you think you're going to get away with that, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> but see, mercy understands the why behind the what. It cares about the person, not just what they've done to us. However, it helps to remember that everyone's hurt. Everyone that hurts others is hurting themselves. As they say, hurting people hurt people. Luke 6 36 through 37 tells us, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Uh, I love how that's described in the Passion Translation. Be like your Father, who is famous for his kindness, to heal even the thankless and cruel. Overflow with mercy and compassion for others, just as your Heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all. Jesus said, forsake the habit of criticizing and judging others, and you will not be criticized and judged. Don't condemn others, and you will not be condemned. Forgive over and over, and you will be forgiven over and over. We reap what we sow, and whatever we give away to others is what we'll receive in return. If you want mercy, 
then so mercy. If you need a friend, then so friendliness. If you have financial needs, then look for ways to meet someone else's needs. One thing I always would tell the kids when they were growing up is if you want to have a good friend, you got to be a good friend. You know, and, and we all know, we've all heard the passage so many times, you reap what you sow when it comes to our finances. If we sow good things, it's more than just finances. We sow good things, we reap good things. And it's easy to judge. I cringe when I look back at the extremely critical and judgmental person that I used to be. And I try to not look back on the past with regrets, but sometimes we all have things that we wish we would have done differently. And some things, and you just can't help how you feel about some things like that. I regret letting my kids hear me be critical of other people when they were little. I'll quote my former pastor, Pastor Marvin Hill, and he has no many, no idea how many times I quote him. <laughs> and I go back to the sayings that I learned in his church. But he had a saying that he used a lot more is caught than taught. And when we're raising kids, what they see is more important than what they hear from what us telling them to do. What, what they see us modeling in our lives. And it's not just kids, it's other people. Like I said, one of the things that will draw people to Jesus is what they see in our lives. If they see good things, if they see us being merciful and kind and loving, that will draw them to Jesus. Not being harsh and critical and, and judgmental and beating somebody over the head with scripture, basically, you know, you're never going to, well, what is the saying, you catch more flies with honey, you know, but um, anyways, I was, I was, I was sowing bad seed, and I was making myself miserable, you know, when we talk about negative things, we feel negative, we feel down, we feel like, you know, you know what your, it, I'm sorry, try to put it into the words that I'm looking for. When you're sitting with a group of people and you're talking bad about somebody, that doesn't feel good inside. And you walk away feeling like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, you know? But when you're feeding people with good food, good words, a good spirit, you walk away from that feeling happy and, and feeling like, I did it, you know, feeling more like you accomplished something positive and beneficial. I, I, that's how I always want to feel when I talk to somebody. And that's why, you know, I mean, some people don't even view gossip as a sin. But it is. And it makes us feel yucky inside when we do it. And I just always want to leave a conversation with feeling like the people feel better than they did when we started the conversation. I don't want to have conversations that leave people feeling down or or critical or judgmental themselves. Okay, the truth is when we sow mercy, we reap a harvest of peace, joy, and healthy relationships. We also take a giant step forward spiritually because choosing to do what's right, even when it hurts, causes us to grow and mature. So I ask you, is there anyone that you can extend mercy to today? I know you can all think of somebody. <laughs> I'm sure. Or are you presently dealing with a hurtful situation? I ask that you would extend mercy and grace to them. Forgive them today. Don't wait for an apology that you very likely will never get. Do it today, not for their sake, but for your own. So you can reap that peace, joy, and healthy relationships and so that you can grow spiritually so that you can be free to be all that God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.